Muscle is a highly specialized form of tissue and possesses the basic physiological property of contractility, which is to say an ability to contract and shorten. In addition, all muscles possess three important physiological properties. Excitability, which denotes the ability of muscle to respond to a stimulus, be it mechanical or electrical. Extensibility, which denotes the ability of muscle to undergo stretching. And elasticity, which denotes the ability of muscle to regain its original shape after it has been stretched or contracted. Broadly speaking, muscle in the human body exists in one of three forms. Skeletal muscle, which is the most abundant variety of muscle. Visceral or smooth muscle, which exists in the walls of blood vessels and in the walls of all hollow viscera. And finally, cardiac muscle, which as its name implies is confined to the heart and perhaps the very terminal bits of the large veins that enter the heart. A fundamental and crucial difference between skeletal muscle on the one hand and cardiac and smooth muscle on the other is the fact that skeletal muscle is under voluntary control and thus is innervated by somatic nerves. By contrast, cardiac muscle and smooth muscle are involuntary and therefore innervated by autonomic nerves. The arrangement of muscle fibers within skeletal muscle can really be only of one of two types. Either the muscle fibers are arranged within the muscle parallel to the line of pull of the muscle, or the muscle fibers are arranged in such a way as to lie oblique to the line of pull. On this basis, you have two broad types of skeletal muscle. Examples of the former type, which is to say where the muscle fibers are arranged parallel to the line of pull, are the sartorius, the rectus abdominis, the powerful muscle in the anterior abdominal wall, the strap muscles in the neck, and indeed the intercostal muscles. Skeletal muscles, where the muscle fibers are arranged oblique to the line of pull, are subdivided into three types, unipennate, bipennate, and multipennate. Incidentally, penna is the Latin word for feather. A unipennate muscle is one in which the tendon of the muscle develops on one side and all the muscle fibers run obliquely into the other edge of the tendon. An example of a unipennate muscle is the powerful flexor pollicis longus, the long flexor of the thumb. A bipennate muscle is one in which muscle fibers run obliquely into either side of the central tendon within the muscle. A very fine example of a bipennate muscle is the rectus femoris part of the quadriceps. And finally, multipennate muscles are muscles where muscle fibers run obliquely into the tendon but from various directions. And these multipennate muscles are very powerful muscles. And a very fine example of a multipennate muscle is the subscapularis, the powerful internal rotator of the shoulder joint. Most skeletal muscles cross joints and are anchored to bone on either side of the joint. Thus, when skeletal muscles contract, they cause movement in the joint. By long-standing convention, and generally speaking, the proximal end of the muscle is referred to as its origin. So the proximal attachment is referred to as its origin, and the distal attachment of the muscle is referred to as its insertion. These terms, origin and insertion, are beginning to lose their flavor. Most present-day anatomists, including myself, tend to use the terms proximal attachment and distal attachment rather than origin and insertion. 
the naming of skeletal muscles is an interesting subject in itself. Muscles are sometimes named on the basis of their shape. Thus, rhomboid major and rhomboid minor are rhomboidal muscles, major and minor, big and small. Quadratus femoris, a muscle in the thigh, is a quadrate muscle. Deltoid, it's triangular in shape. So these are muscles named for their shape. Yet other muscles are named on the basis of their function. For example, flexor pollicis longus, the long flexor of the thumb, flexor hallucis longus, the long flexor of the big toe, flexor digitorum longus, the long flexor of the digits of the hand or foot, and there are other muscles which are named for their attachments. Sternocleidomastoid, something of a tongue twister. It is attached to the sternum, it is attached to the clavicle, and superiorly, it is attached to the mastoid process in the skull base. Sternothyroid, it is attached to the sternum at its lower end, and at its upper end is attached to the thyroid cartilage. So these names denote the attachments at either end of the muscle. Yeah. Huh. Your anatomy matters.